Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Plus and our three-part series on the weather. I'm your host, Julian, and if you missed part one, we debunked the old notion that your weather forecast is always wrong. So if you're giving your meteorologist a hard time, maybe check that out, ease up on them a little bit. I mean, it's not like they control the weather, right? Or do they? No, they don't. Or do they? No, but today we are going to talk about controlling the weather. You may have noticed higher temperatures, stronger storms, and more abnormal weather events becoming less and less abnormal lately. Well, maybe the idea of actually controlling the weather starting to seem like a pretty useful option to have in our toolbox. But the big question is, is controlling the weather actually even possible? And if so, how could it be done? Well, let's get into it. The idea of controlling the weather sounds kind of like an evil plan hatched by a James Bond villain, but it's closer to reality than you might think. Here's a true story that once made headlines, but today it's not very well remembered. In the 60s, war was raging in Vietnam, and the US military thought, uh, this isn't going our way. Maybe we should try something a little more unconventional, which usually doesn't end well. Their bright idea was to start a clandestine operation to extend the monsoon season in Vietnam by releasing silver and lead iodide into an existing storm. By making more rain, the goal was to increase flooding and thereby disrupt troop movement and the deliveries of supplies to the North Vietnamese. The enemy would be destabilized and the US would win the war. So, make mud, not war was even an unofficial catchphrase used by the pilots on these cloud seeding missions. These missions were dubbed Operation Popeye. I don't know why I haven't found a good explanation, but there you go. They went on for five years before the public found out about them and the cloud seeding stopped. While there's no confirmation that these missions had any real effect, we can confirm what was happening in the skies based on atmospheric science and previous lab experiments. Basically, water vapor condenses around particles in the atmosphere. These are called cloud condensation nuclei. They're the beginnings of every cloud droplet. You can think of these little nuclei as like seeds from which fully developed raindrops originate. Silver iodide particles have a similar structure to these initial ice nuclei seeds, which allows water droplets to condense around them, freeze, and then fall as either rain or snow, depending on the air temperature. Adding more and more of these seeds into clouds basically helps bring the precipitation faster than it would come naturally, or so we think. Now I hope the term cloud seeding makes a little more sense. In an ideal scenario, more cloud seeds equals more rain, which was the goal for Operation Popeye. Still can't get over that name, it's so weird. The US isn't the only country to dabble in weather modification, but it's not always used for nefarious purposes. See, after Operation Popeye, weather modification was actually banned from being used in warfare, but it's still allowed when it comes to peaceful purposes. In 2020, the United Arab Emirates faced deadly heat waves, and to counter the arid climate, they ran about 200 cloud seeding operations in the first six months of the year to bring more rain into the region. Canada has used cloud seeding to limit the intensity of hailstorms, and China has enthusiastically embraced cloud seeding, putting billions into the technology. They've used it for everything from reducing air pollution in Beijing to even improving weather conditions ahead of big events like the 2008 Olympics. It would make sense to think that changing the weather on this large scale requires a lot of starter particles, but sometimes that's just not how it works. Most of the time, cloud seeding doesn't even require that much silver iodide to nudge a storm to do its thing. One gram of the stuff can create around 10 trillion artificial ice crystals. So typically, cloud seeding operations only release small quantities of the particles. That sounds almost like anybody could do it, but it's not that simple. First, silver iodide is pretty toxic stuff. You'd want to handle it with care. There's also an important caveat to understand as well when it comes to cloud seeding. And that is, no one is entirely sure how effective the practice actually is. If Joe Schmo wanted to release silver iodide into clouds over his next door neighbor's house because the neighbor had a barbecue and didn't invite Mr. Schmo, Schmo wouldn't definitively know how much his rain DIY seeding operation actually caused rain to fall and ruin his neighbor's day. But I can see why the neighbor didn't invite him if he's willing to go to those extremes. In other words, once a cloud is seeded, scientists 
don't have a good way of figuring out how much more rain or snow would have fallen compared to how much actually would have fallen naturally if the cloud was just left alone. So a quick refresher. For precipitation to occur, there needs to be clouds already in the sky. These clouds would have likely deposited rain or snow or hail anyway. It gets even more complicated because those atmospheric conditions happen once and only once exactly that way. How often do you know Mother Nature to play out the same scenario a second time on command just because it would be useful for gathering data? So because it's impossible to replicate atmospheric conditions in a natural setting, it gets really hard to prove definitively how effective cloud seeding is outside of lab experiments. Even during Operation Popeye, there were reports that the missions were successful, but no one collected any data from Vietnam to really back up that claim. Fast forward to today, and there's still a lot of uncertainty when it comes to cloud seeding's effectiveness. I've seen some reports suggest it can bring anywhere between 10 to 15% additional precipitation if conditions are right, but I've also seen studies suggesting a negligible difference. Now, I'm not here to poo-poo cloud seeding. Without a doubt, something is happening as a result, but it can get pretty murky, and the history of weather modification has also been home to its fair share of charlatans. There's something called the hail cannon. It basically looks like a blunderbuss someone would use to shoot Zeus, and some farmers today swear by it. But there's no hard evidence that backs up its effectiveness. There were salesmen during the 19th and 20th centuries who would travel through areas impacted by drought, and they would convince people who were desperate enough to pay them that they could bring the rain. I'm not joking when I say that one of these guys even called himself the moisture accelerator, which is a Gross nickname. You gotta wonder, is that his only job with a name like that? Don't think about it too much. Now, we've talked a lot about using cloud seeding to increase precipitation, but is there a way to stop it? Like, if someone were to accidentally seed just too many clouds and make it rain too much? Well, we actually can use Operation Popeye as an example. Between 1967 and 1972, the US military ran over 2,000 cloud seeding missions and it probably won't come as a surprise to you that every now and again, they miss their target. In an interview with the New York Times, one official once said, we used to go out flying around and looking for a certain cloud formation, and we made a lot of mistakes. One of those mistakes was pummeling a US military camp with about 18 centimeters of rain over the course of two hours. Another mistake was reported in a memo between a couple of officials which said, quote, in one instance, the rainfall continued as the cloud moved eastward across the Vietnam border and inundated a U.S. Special Forces camp with nine inches of rain in four hours, unquote. It's a lot of rain in a short amount of time. So as you can see, once the storm gets going, there's not a lot that can be done to stop it. But that hasn't kept people from taking this idea even further. See, when the first cloud seeding experiments were performed in the 40s, people were convinced that our advancing science had the power to control the planet's thermometer. It was supposed to herald a new era when we could take a scalpel to the skies. If we wanted rain, we would get a downpour. And if we wanted a sunny, beautiful day, well, by golly, we'd have clear skies. If a hurricane was heading towards a populated area, we could divert the storm like Hercules diverting the rivers. But making it rain, so to speak, that's peanuts compared to controlling something as large and powerful as an entire hurricane. If we want to figure out how to stop a hurricane, it helps to know how they begin. First, you get two adult hurricanes that love each other very much, and wait, no, that's something else. Oh, I remember, okay, so typically, hurricanes start out over water when the surface temperature reaches at least 27 degrees Celsius. Warm ocean air starts to rise, and low pressure areas move in. With this low pressure comes wind, which pushes in more warm air. And the warm air continues to rise until it cools off and forms clouds and storms. So one idea would be to cool the sea surface temperature before it reaches that 27 degree threshold. This idea is called marine cloud brightening, and it uses cloud seeding as a way to increase the number of droplets in a cloud, making them whiter and more reflective to sunlight. A couple of scientists have proposed sending a fleet of autonomous ships to the Atlantic Ocean before hurricane season begins, where they would mill around seeding clouds with cool salt water. That way, by the time the next hurricane season comes around, 
ocean currents have cooled to the point where mega hurricanes just can't form anymore. There's also an idea to increase bubbles on the water surface. It's kind of the same concept. It would whiten the water and reflect more sunlight. There's even more wild ideas like nuking hurricanes, but those are uh, far-fetched and dangerous to say the least. We'll likely see things like this keep popping up again and again, though, as we continue to experience more megastorms as the climate warms. I probably don't need to mention it, but I will. The vast majority of climate scientists believe that our climate is warming, and it's probably going to lead to more frequent and more severe storms in the future. Which might make you wonder, if the future we're facing looks like that, maybe it makes more sense to alter the entire climate rather than just individual storms. Will we have more success if we go down that route? Well, messing with the Earth's natural systems to combat climate change is called geoengineering. Cloud seeding is a technique of geoengineering, but it's often used to describe changing single weather events. What some people want to do is completely alter the climate over the long term, not just on a case-by-case -case basis. There's one such technique that's been proposed, and it's been getting more attention in recent years. It's called solar geoengineering. Essentially, this type of intervention means limiting the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. There's a project at Harvard called Scopex, and it's proposing to do just that. The team behind the project plans to launch a balloon up into the atmosphere where it will release around 100 grams of calcium carbonate. It's a common ingredient in antacids. And they would measure things like atmospheric chemistry and how well light scatters off of these particles. And the results would help determine if the project was a success and how maybe it could be scaled up. Now, this project is still in the experimental phase and it needs more review before getting off the ground. No pun intended. However, if everything works out, years down the road, we might be seeing this project or something like it releasing particles into the atmosphere. So sunlight would reflect back and the planet would cool down, theoretically. Of course, the big concern with this or any geoengineering project is we don't know what the unintended consequences might be. We talked about chaos theory in episode one, how small changes can make big differences. Well, what will the planet look like if we make a sudden, really big change? As of right now, there's no need to get worked up just yet. This project hasn't even launched and it's still being reviewed. But it does provoke some interesting questions like, can we successfully change the climate on a large scale like this? And if we did, is it too little too late? And who would be in charge of such a far reaching global project? Now. There's almost an endless number of questions about altering the climate on these large scales. I can't get into all of them here. But maybe Earth isn't even the place to try these modifications out anyway. Yeah, let's talk about terraforming. We'll do that in our next episode. Be sure to check back for that. But for now, thanks so much for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time on Seeker Plus.